Western. And um, they uh, actually uh, are part of, or at, excuse me, at the very end um, and starting to come to a close of the seven months. Um, but we wanted to share some of the conversations that we were having because one of the parts of sort of leadership that Karen and I were talking about was the opportunity to hear from people who've had experience and to hear of different journeys. And so we thought, let's um, host this webinar and share a little bit um, about uh, all the conversations we're having with anyone who is interested. And Karen, how many folks are supposedly <laughs> signed up uh, for today? That's so exciting. It's our very first time and we have 60 people signed up. Uh, yay. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. If you're all over the world. So um, the questions that are actually going to be asked today have been designed by our four fellows who have been going through their own leadership development, as explained. And uh, Karen and I are going to um, sort of guide through these really wonderful questions and hopefully give some insights. We also hope that whoever is here on the webinar with us, um, that we get to hear from you. And definitely, we're going to give some time for any questions and answers as you um, hear the conversation. But one of the ways that we always started our, um, our fellowship get togethers, and you may not know, um, but our four fellows are from four very different geographic areas. And so every time we would meet, oftentimes online, we would be like, well, what time is it? Where are you right now? What time is it? Um, and what is your weather like? Um, so we thought we would just symbolically start the way that we begin many of our um, online get togethers with the four fellows. And um, this is a great way for you to get to know, of course, the system. Um, if you can, um, Karen, I'm looking right now, but what I would love for everyone to do is to write that. What is your name? Where are you right now? What time is it right now? And what is your weather? So if yeah. people could start contributing that, so your name, where are you, what time is it, and your weather. And Karen, do you want to describe how people could write that in? Yes. So at the bottom of your screen, there's something called chat, or there should be something called chat, and that's where you can type things in. So I'll just, hopefully you can see this. This is to all panelists or all panelists and attendees. So I say, my name is Karen Young. I'm in Boston. It's 52 degrees. Sorry, I don't know what that is in Celsius. And it's raining. Hopefully you can see that. Can you see that? Let's at least see if some folks can try. I see that, Karen. And I am going to write, my name is Michelle. I'm in Portland, Oregon. I think it's about 55 degrees and it's foggy scent. <laughs> 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 Tiffany, you try. Oh, look. I'm okay. Happy. Awesome. This is so great. People are doing it. This is the way we do it interactive. Say hello. Yay. Hello. Hey, Zoom Sil. from Canada. Mm -hmm. Sil. Go ahead, Michelle. You can read them up. Oh, okay. Sil um, in central Massachusetts. Um, I, well, we aren't typing fast, too fast, so I can write it. It's 6.04 Eastern time, cloudy, supposed to snow. Ah. Good, luck. Good luck. Okay, now it's getting faster. Okay, so hello to Izumi in Toronto. Derek, hello. Los Angeles, oh, whatever, Sunny. Well, I hope you're okay in Los Angeles and California. All 78 like. degrees. Yes. Um, Andrea in Ontario, Kingston, Ontario, Canada. Hello, Eileen, who is one of our fellows. Um, Jesse, New Zealand, also one of our fellows. Um, oh yeah, we didn't we didn't write our time, Karen. That was not a good modeling. <laughs> <laughs> Twelve p.m. on Wednesday. Excellent. Oh, oh, excellent! It's coming so fast. It's so exciting. Twenty eight. Yay. Rosa from Paris, excellent. Sue, hello Sue, Lisa, uh, Yasmin, Jeff, Tanaka, Gail, Montgomery. This is going so fast I can't read them all. Rebecca from Oregon, 50 degrees. Jeff Tanaka from BC, excellent. Yasmin from Swansea, hi. Yes, 
Chris <laughs> Kubo, yay, Vanessa no. in Andover. Lisa Shiota from DC. Yes, Margaret Hi, McKenzie. Hi, from San Jose. Yes. Wow, we are very well represented. Keep on coming along. Keep on coming. And, um, we, uh, this is just an example of how we hope that y'all might uh, participate in some of the ways in which we're thinking about um, connecting um, through this webinar. So uh, thank you if you just joined us. Um, we are doing some brief introductions. You can go to the, the participant chat um, to just see where everyone is. And um, I also just wanted to mention that this particular webinar will be recorded. Um, because we do want to think about access beyond anyone who is available just now. So um, please all know that uh, this can be available. And if you like the conversation, please pass this along. We'll have this um, accessible for you all in, in the future. We'll, we'll let you know where that is going to exist. Okay. Rossi. Rossi's here. 80 degrees. Hi, Rossi. <laughs> Yay. Oh. 80. Margaret. Oh, my gosh. She converted for us 19 degrees Fahrenheit. What? Oh, crisps. Minus seven Celsius. Liz from Winnipeg. Oh my gosh. This is the best way to have such a global <laughs> community right now. Keith and Tiffany, you're the very first. Like, oh, this is amazing. Tiffany's here. Isabel from Spain. Oh, yay. Hello. <laughs> It's cool to um, to see uh, names that you know faces and names that we know, and also new folks as well. So um, welcome all. While we move into, um, I sort of give some context about the the connection to our fellowship, um, as well as the questions that are being designed. Um, our panelists today, um, PJ and uh, Tiffany, have wisdom they have experienced Tycho. <laughs> <laughs> you have experienced okay. this drum uh for a long time or for a while for a while you know and um and so through uh through our questions i think you all um online are gonna get to get to know them and hopefully get some new perspectives um so why don't we start with the Tycho journey um I don't know if you want to go back, way back when, um, but it sort of implies wherever you want to start, like what attracted you to Tycho? Um, and, and what were you thinking of when you began your Tycho journey? And maybe what were your goals? Maybe it's changed throughout the years, but um, where, wh how, would, how would you talk about what attracted you to this drum? You want to go, PJ? No, you go to. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I started as a little child standing in front of a bone daiko. <laughs> My mom said I would just stand there going like crazy um, because I just was drawn to the sound of it. And over time, I would ask the members of the Mino group if I could play. And they kept telling me, no, you're a girl. And girls don't do that. Um, and that was frustrating. And eventually I got to see San Jose and San Francisco in performance at various food bazaars and thought, wow, this is really great, but they're all so far away. And see, by now I'm in high school. I get to go to Japan and experience Taiko in Japan for the first time as a sophomore. Um, and I come back and I see Kodo in performance at UC Davis and decide that is what I'm, I need to do it. Whatever that is, I'm going to do it. And so um, I started looking for opportunities to see more Taiko and to try to join the groups closest to me. And um, why I had to, it just, I had to do it. That's all I know is a calling. And over time, um, initially it was just, I'm going to start a group in Sacramento because there's not a group in Sacramento and that would be super great so that people here can learn and I can learn and, um, kids that want to learn like me when I was growing up, um, will have an opportunity to do it. And 
throughout the years over time, uh, in my focus has shifted from uh, being a community resource and, and being uh, an artist and trying to put myself out into the world and, and share what I think is beautiful and funky and cool. Um, and now I'm at the point where I'm looking at not my legacy, I guess, but um, in terms of what I want to achieve with Tycho. Um, uh, <laughs> I do want to make an impact on, on the status of women because throughout my time, even though women have always been a part of Tycho and I've always had people like PJ and, and other peers and contemporaries and um, other artists to look at, my focus has shifted to really wanting to see more women players um, and performers on stage when I'm on stage because very often I am one of the few women on stage uh, at various events and so it's been kind of a big journey from being just a little kid who really wanted a drum to then trying to step into my uh, life as an artist and now as somebody with wisdom <laughs> Uh, wanting to make an impact uh, because the community is just so amazing and wonderful. I, I just like to see more more women represented. I don't know if I stayed on topic there, but that's kind of my journey from there to here. For me, um... Let me go back to the early 70s. And that was, um, I have to give you a backdrop in that I was uh, trying to find my Asian American identity. I grew up as a kid with very poor self-esteem because I was bullied. I didn't know that I was bullied until a few years ago. <laughs> but that's what it was, <laughs> being considered different. I, I didn't know that had a label. I, I just thought that something was wrong with me. And um, to, so to see in early 70s, San Francisco Taiko Dojo at um, uh, festival performance, the thing that really moved me besides the sound of the taiko uh, was seeing a mother and a daughter um, playing together uh, as equally and as strong as the men and there was just something that was very visceral that really moved and shook me and that was something that also like tiffany i have to do that <laughs> and that have to do that was like to um yeah be loud you know find something to do as we're exploring uh, and uncovering you know what our potential power is uh as a for me, I was never in my skin, you know, from, from day one in, in school. And I would say that it was that, that shake, that, uh, yeah, vibration. It hit me. I have to do it. And, um, wow, I don't think I've really reached wisdom capacity yet <laughs> if anything it's more life experience and maybe the layers of experiences of uh starting 46 years ago doing taiko that from trying to define taiko to an audience that never heard of it what is it is it dance is it music is it theater is it martial arts and the answer is yes, <laughs> mm. all, all of that. It's a holistic art form. And it's not only the act of doing, it's like how you do it. How do you do it uh, as a person in connection to another member, in connection to the community that you come from? I mean, that, that's like so easy, of course, you're attracted to play taiko but when you see the magnitude of what taiko can do and like wow this is community organizing wow um by virtue of san jose taiko being in san jose japantown i mean that's a blessing 
in that it, it gives a cultural context. It anchored me in my identity as well. And it wasn't just only for my self indulgence, <laughs> but I saw that there were a number of people my age and even the community was like, wow, you're representing us. It's great to see you in a festival, you know, and to hear um, people, my grandmother's age, you know, to be in tears, you know, saying, I'm so proud, you know, you're doing this. It's, that's like, that's why I have to play it as well. Um, and, and it's been this journey of like finding what is the next step. And some of you may know and may not, some of you may not know, but having left San Jose Tycho as a director, this is already eight years ago. Oh, I know, wow. Um, <laughs> that journey has been pretty uh, steep, steep for me like from ensemble playing, community organizing as a Taiko community. It's like, where do I place my lens um, now? I don't have to start from zero. And um, I'm finding an incredible uh, journey now is like, how do I co-create as well with the Taiko community, but it's like outside the Taiko community. How can we become more creative to tap into our full potential? And that's what I feel that Tycho uh, has groomed me for and um, continues to support me. Um, so, yeah, I'm looking for new opportunities. <laughs> you know, both of you spoke of identity and Tycho. Um, and I wonder if you might... Um, might even speak a little bit more about that. Um, both both of you spoke at sort of like a young age, having some realizations about difference. Um, how is how is that sort of played out within the choices of of how you've been a Taiko artist and um, also discovered yourself? I think for me, um, being reasonably good at Taiko has given me the confidence to sort of, even when I don't feel like in my identity, I also, as a child was not so confident and was um, not necessarily bullied, but as an Asian American and uh, as a, you know, as a minority growing up, um, Taiko gave me the opportunity, right, to be loud, to be visible, to make a difference in my community. And the more success that I had doing that, the more I was able to take that capacity into other aspects of my life. And so that's always been really um, a great benefit that I think Tycho has helped me with. Um, no matter what situation I'm in now, I can say, well, I, I, I did that Odaiko solo and we went out there and we did that show and everything, like I was able to do that. So if I can just take that same feeling, that same passion, and apply it to this thing that I don't feel really good about, that I don't feel confident in doing. If I can do Taiko, I can do this. Um, and just all the experiences of trying to find the next thing uh, in terms of uh, brainstorming or like figuring out the things that I had to figure out as a Taiko group leader um, has also given me uh, the capacity to, to organize again, outside of, 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 of Tycho, um, different projects and different things that have helped, you know, increase the um, capacity of my life, my ability to live. And in terms of being in the community, um, I think there's been uh, a bit of an iconoclastic uh, push from my end, um, against the injustices that I saw within my community. And so in terms of looking at my identity as an Asian woman, uh, somebody who is genderqueer, somebody who um, doesn't necessarily fit in all the boxes in a comfortable way, um, as a Taiko player within the Taiko community, being accepted by everyone um, as a human being, as a person, as an artist has also uh, really helped to shift and shape my identity uh, in the world as I move around it. Cool. 
how do I follow that up? <laughs> <laughs> Identity has probably been the foremost theme of um, staying on the path of Tycho because um, of course it was like finding that cultural identity connection. Um, also, uh, I have to say that um, coming from a community organizing background, even before coming to Tycho, we were, uh, our value system was definitely about how to level the playing field, you know, and how um, we can empower ourselves and others how do we step into um being uh one that could be respected you know that honors that respect that understanding um that acceptance and how can i do that without talking you know um to do that with full conviction and heart playing um that's the most direct and way you can communicate um so that allowed me to step into that confidence and like tiffany you know um to be a taiko player is one thing to perform to create uh and to be a taiko leader um it's like allowed me to step into leadership ways of leadership how do I want to lead? Um, and, and that's identity as well. Um, I think I'll just keep it at that. And I add a bit of gratitude um, because I do also want to say that there's a lot that I take for granted in terms of, of identity and being Asian and, and, and being empowered in a way because of the work that you did, PJ, that I think a lot of us do. Um, mm -hmm or a lot of people in the world and in the community take for granted so much because of the, the work that you've put into it and, and the, the way you've led and the, the, the example you've set. I just want to thank you for that. Thank you. Can we have a cry fest? <laughs> well, yeah, well, Tiffany, actually, that's a really good point because um, I'm sorry to make this a PJ fest for a second, but um, uh, Karen and I, you know, I know we both raised our hands and we also um, were speaking of um, sometimes uh, sharing a bit of our own Tycho journey and, and um, I'll start. And then I know Karen, you raised your hand too. Um, but just thinking of, uh, for myself, I literally started with San Jose Taiko. I grew up in San Jose, California, and San Jose Taiko was like the group that I grew up seeing when I went to Obong every year from, I don't know, beyond um, even memory. Um, and, and because of San Jose Taiko, I, I just always had this uh, growing desire of the drum and then also of myself. and. Um, I came to you and came to San Jose Taiko as a very confused person, um, trying to figure myself out. And I remember I originally started out just trying to interview you um, and Roy. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, for a report. And then, um, and then you said, well, why don't you try it? Um, but it's those little moments. And then I was like, sure, I'll go do a workshop. And, and little did I know that was going to change my entire life trajectory um, of finding myself. And again, the word identity and um, feeling really confused at my place in space. And, and you know, I too just want to thank you. Um, and I think also thanking you too, Tiffany, because when I started seeing you perform, I was just like, Oh my goodness, you know, like this, look at the possibility. Um, I feel so fortunate to have at such a formative time of Tycho um, have witnessed so many <coughs> strong, strong women um, playing and being a model. And then I thought that could be possible for me too. Um, and, and I don't know if I, if I didn't see it, if I would have believed in myself to do it. Now look at you. 
I just want to say also, Izumi says out there, yes, I totally agree with you, Tiffany. Actually, all of you to be out there being the amazing women, uh, Taiko leaders, and Margaret saying, amen. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Karen? Though? I'll just say really briefly, because I know we've got a lot of questions here and want to keep us on track, but um, my story is much like PJ's, funny, um, just a few decades later, a couple decades later, but in terms of identity and community organizing, those have been sort of my main elements that have been most attractive to me, and I think particularly the pioneers that were activists and organizers um, made the art form that much more um, um, compelling. And I first saw Tycho when I was a student in California and Shasta Tycho came to my college campus. So Jeannie Mercer and Russell Baba and Shoji Oz, I think they were 11 years old at the time. Um, and I was really intrigued with the family, you know, being on stage and these boys getting up there and like um, it being multi-generational. And also that Russell and Jeannie talked about, you know, the um, Japanese internment and the uh, incarceration. And um, that was the first time I saw people that looked like me talk about um, in the injustice of uh, World War II. And, um, and that, you know, was completely opposite from what I was trained to, to do as an Asian woman, which was to kind of not make waves, not speak up, not um, kind of acknowledge sort of history's um, uh, injustice. And so it just really cracked open a lot of things for me um, about what was possible for me. Um, and I started studying um, ethnic studies, Asian American studies, and it really just sort of brought me on a path of self-discovery. Um, and when I got to Boston, um, so I was a student organizer at that time. So my grounding and roots were in organizing. And when I got to Boston, um, I found Elaine Fong, who had just um, moved, had she moved to Boston and she had left Sodaiko um, and actually was doing some work with San Jose Taiko. Um, and she was starting a group in Boston. And so I worked and um, worked to help start Odaiko New England with Elaine and I played with them for 15 years. And then, you know, at some point when I turned 40 um, in the height of the recession, I was like, I want to do, <laughs> how do I do this full time? Uh, you know, my organizing work, work, youth organizing work was being done as my main work and Taiko was my side gig as many of us. And um, I wanted to see if I could combine the two. Uh, leadership development, community organizing, um, and this art form that I loved so much. And uh, so, yes, in the height of the recession, I said, I'm going to be an artist full time. And um, I spent a few years trying to figure out how to financially make that happen. It was everything from like, you know, down, like downgrading my crate and barrel couch to an Ikea couch. <laughs> selling furniture, getting roommates, figuring out how to get myself out of debt so I could um, be as flexible as possible to create a, a work, a, a work life that meant being an artist. Um, and so I started the Genki Spark. Um, and from that, that's been nine years now. And um, in the last couple of years, really sort of ground myself into being what, uh, what I've discovered as a social practice artist or uh, cultural artist or arts activist where you're really using the art as a vehicle to build communities and have uh, mostly been doing that work in the last couple of years. Yay. <laughs> cool. So should we move well, on now? Or? Yeah, we, let's do it. We've okay. been talking about journeys, but let's talk about uh, the other part of the journey too. Fabulous start. Um, so I'm going to ask a question that has to do with um, uh, in your journey, what obstacles have you encountered or are encountering and how do you handle them? And so I'm going to ask the panelists to say a bit here, but this is actually where we want to turn to you, um, the 35 folks um, on the webinar, because we think we're trying to figure out and we're trying things out here. We want to hear mm -hmm. and have us be a little bit interactive. So your key obstacles and um, how you handle them. Uh, PJ or Tiffany, who wants to start? <laughs> Are you looking at? <laughs> oh gosh, um, let, let, let me just go back to maybe a, a fundamental obstacle in the very beginning was like, how do you define Tycho? <laughs> it was hard. 
you know, never <laughs> seen it before. You know, it's like before the um, multicultural art scene was happening. And, and that, that was exactly the, the challenge at that time. And um, how do you uh, educate potential funders? You know, um, what do you do? Um, but that was probably one of the challenges. A challenge is also how do you um, create an organizational style that uh, fits core values, core values that you put into your training. Everybody doesn't necessarily come with the same core values, but how can we uh, create some type of way of um, creating the art and also living the art and also um, be organized um, and how do you think about sustainability like in terms of training uh, and learning and uh, generations um, that's you know organizationally uh, major um, personal obstacles I will say now which I, I think in terms of where I am at is something that for everybody else who also is aspiring to continue playing Taiko into your years, that's where I am. Mm -hmm. I'm being, uh, I'm using discernment, like how I use my time. Uh, and um, how I want to play Taiko and um, in a senior body. So I'm looking at what is life like when there aren't too many role models out there as I'm creating a new way that fits for me, but I'm hoping that it becomes another uh, way for others to look at themselves when they get to this age. <laughs> so PJ, you threw out a lot of obstacles in the beginning. Um, are there some ways you've been handling those obstacles or how would you say? Okay, the first two obstacles are past tense. <laughs> And that I'm not um, with San Jose Taiko anymore and, and not having to construct from zero. Um, and maybe I can just speak about how I'm I handling uh, where I am now. Um, number one, for uh, looking into how not to play. I mean, I cannot play Taiko as I did when I was younger. How do I find this uh, what what fits for this body at this time? Mm -hmm. How can I be creative? And uh, I, I'm um, opening up opportunities to work with different people in the studio, of which I have access, and um, exploring, exploring creatively. Uh, also for particular um, projects as well, uh, community building projects. So that is what fuels me and makes me not consider obstacles as obstacles. Mm -hmm. It's like, wow, this is a challenge, but I can be inventive. <laughs> it's not a problem, you know, and I can and I know I can't do it by myself. So how do I open my world up to um, working with other people, hearing other people, hearing other people's creativity that sometimes it becomes so much more powerful in the, in the original vision you have. So that's how I've been handling my recent um, challenges. Thank you, that's great. Tiffany. Um, so in the beginning, of course, it's the, the same as almost everybody. How do we find a space? How do we build the drums? How do we, build enough support from the community to keep going. Um, and I was really lucky in that my parents sort of instilled this anything is possible attitude. We just have to find the right people, the right resources, as long as you keep trying. Um, so bit by bit, those obstacles sort of, they didn't melt away. I mean, it, it certainly took a lot of effort, but it was just reaching out and finding people and reaching out and talking to people and reaching out and trying to build community connections um, to sort of surmount those obstacles as they came up. 
and now, or, or I guess a little bit further into it, language was an issue and gender was an issue as I started to perform in Japan. And actually language is still the one thing I think um, not being fluent in Japanese has been one of the major things that has held me back mm -hmm. as an artist. Um, and so I highly recommend that if you have the opportunity, if you really love Taiko, to, to learn as much Japanese as you can so that you can talk freely with Japanese artists, um, which is something I still haven't managed to do. Um, and really what I'm facing now, the, the challenges are economic and, and in terms of time and um, trying to find and make enough work and to do Taiko and just do Taiko instead of taking on part-time, other part-time work um, and to do a, be a touring artist as opposed to um, a stay at home, manage my organization administrator, uh, run school programs and write grants artist. Um, that's been most particularly challenging in the last little while, especially when the economy took, took a dip and, and arts funding dried up and my organization shifted from being able to pay me a salary to not. And so a lot of the challenge now is just trying to book as much work as I can um, everywhere I can, you know, we'll drum for food. Um, <laughs> and it's been interesting because over time I've seen different groups from uh, very grassroots to professional level and how they've engaged in marketing themselves and how they've engaged in uh, consensus and community building and the ways that has impacted group development and artistic development and seeing things like writing grants and how sometimes grants can drive the projects you do based on what they'll fund and having to take a step back from that and saying, no, I'm not going to actually go for that grant because that's not the work I want to do. And so a part of it too is managing the energy I'm putting into my artistic career and a certain level of burnout. So one of the biggest challenges as a professional taiko player um, even as a group administrator is um, dealing with right recruitment and retention of performers and getting people trained and understanding that at least from my understanding of how it's how it works there's a roughly 75 to 80 percent attrition rate after two years and so how do you rebuild a group over and over again uh, as people move on and I think all of those things it's just at least the way I've approached it is well now what are we going to do? Let's <laughs> let's make the best of what we got. Yeah, great. Thank you, Michelle. You know there is um, <clears throat> someone who did write one of their obstacles, um, and I wonder if if um, maybe we could read it and uh, get some of your thoughts. Um, sounds like they're starting anew, and it says um, in the Q and A section. Um, I started Tycho six years ago with my family and we disconnected from the group last May. Um, we have seven Tycho at home and found a community center to use for free. A few friends want to learn. We really love Tycho and want to spread the culture, but we are very intimidated because we have no experience teaching. Do you have any guidelines, tips for the first classes? Doko doko. <laughs> uh, posture, any specific song. Um, starting to do. I mean, um, I, I wonder if you have any encouraging um, thoughts uh, for someone going through that transition. Tiffany, I uh, think in, you're in, in, Invite Tiffany. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, invite <laughs> Tiffany. Oh, you were <laughs> muted though, Tiffany. I saw you speaking. Sorry. <laughs> I actually, I forgot to unmute. Um, yes, I'm happy to help. Um, but also, <laughs> I think when I first started Sacramento, I, I have, had just been going to San Francisco Taiko Dojo. And what I started with was, I, I learned this this week. This is what I'm going to share with you. And there's a lot of resources online. There's a lot of videos that didn't exist when I first started. I, the first time I did a search for Taiko on lying on the internet there I got five hits and four of them were for a book called Taiko about the regent of Japan and not even Taiko and now you do a google search for Taiko and you get a billion hits um, on YouTube you, there are hundreds of thousands of videos that you can look to 
to see different styles from groups all over the world. And then, um, you know, as you start, your, as you're just starting out, um, if you sort of base yourself in the joy of sharing what you love about Taiko and sharing as much as you know with each other and looking to whatever sources you can get, looking to whatever instructors that you can bring in or whatever conferences or regional Taiko gatherings or workshops um, that are happening. Um, there's so many resources like Kadon too, that, that you, there are classes and things uh, resources available to you just as you're starting out. All of the people that, that are participating on this panel and all, most of the people that are participating on the rest of the panels do workshops. Um, you can invite any of us in and we'll share, we're happy to share what we have learned with you. So um, don't, don't be afraid just because you, you don't have the creds. Um, just start and get together and practice. That's my, that's my two cents. I agree with that totally, um, and um, I I feel that you don't have to hold the the responsibility to be the leader. That if you you frame yourself as that we are developing this together, that we are finding the way um, uh, to learn together. There's something that really brings you together, you know, um, and not having one person or a few people to be the lead, because that's what uh, uh, oftentimes um, uh, obstacles that happen is that people get very relaxed and going, oh, you know, the leader will take care of that, you know, but if everybody is working together and even, you know, being so um, um, vulnerable to say, you know, I am not in the position to lead right now. My desire is to, but we all are in the same position and let's let's find out what that's all about bring in a workshop later so that you all can experience that together learn together and that's like <laughs> san jose taiko's number one song was called taiko one <laughs> <laughs> taiko one that's great <laughs> just a series of repetitive <laughs> rhythm patterns and we would go out for you know and perform taiko one uh, <laughs> <laughs> same patterns over and over for 20 minutes <laughs> that's so funny <laughs> if we could um just also crowdsource a little bit there's 34 people on this 36 people on this um webinar what are your like favorite um resources for teaching like one thing i'm thinking about is rome hamner has a bunch of videos that she's yes. putting out um on on teaching but if you would just type into the chat right now like, are there web, web resources that you use for teaching, um, right. et cetera? Let's just type them in and have a couple minutes here. and We can crowdsource what people use um, in terms of tips and resources for teaching. Does anyone know Rome Hamner's um, uh, website? Is it just romehamner dot something? Something like that. Yeah. If you, if you Google. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure. Rome Hamner. Rome is great, Isabel is saying. Hamner. Google. Oh, great. Here we go. Thank you, Isabel. Rome, yeah, Rome just put on Rome. Oh, Rome's there. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Rome. All right. And um, I love smiling face. Thumbs up. I've loved those videos myself. I've watched them. Yep. I've used them. They're wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, I agree. Other, you know, Thanks, Rome. Tyco <laughs> Source has some um, a lot of open source songs. Um, I don't know if Ben's on the line. Um, Tyco Source, I think they're .org or com. Oh, forgive There's me. All these amazing instructional videos, like Genki's "How to Make Your Own Katsugi Practice Oketa." <laughs> yeah. Actually, my group just watched your video and they made Oketo. So thank you so much, Karen. Well, that's so great. Taiko yes. Source, Kadan, there we go. Isabella saying that. Margaret saying lots of LA Taiko Institute Lati content is open source. That's right. Mm -hmm. I love this. Uh, Eileen had said something. Please share to all panelists and attendees to share all. I'm not sure what that is. Um, huh. I do not see that. Yeah. Uh, oh, it says, 
Please share tall. Oh. We don't have mirrors in our practice space, so we videotape sections of our pieces so that anyone can teach them later on and review form, rhythm, et cetera. Cool. So mirrors, you're not, not having mirrors in your practice space, videotaping them. Mm -hmm. I know our group puts them on yeah, YouTube. We took and then mirrors out of our practice space because we found that people retain stuff better when they weren't watching themselves as they were trying to learn. Mm -hmm. So don't, the lack of mirrors is not a huge obstacle. Great for the idea of videotaping them and then having them so that you can use them with yep. each other. Let's see, Anne um, and Isaku teach online as well. Great. Um, okay, so let's move on. Thank you for that moment of crowdsourcing. This is what I like about this interactive webinar aspect. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited about this next question, partly because I actually don't know how I would answer it. Um, so I'm very curious how you're going to answer this one. Um, curious minds would like to know, um, what does your life look like? Um, so like, what is like a typical day or week look like for you? Um, what percentage of your time do you spend examples here, rehearsing, performing, composing, meeting with people, planning, traveling, paperwork, et cetera. Um, do you have a type of life? Do you have a non type of life? So <laughs> um, I love how you're going to answer this. And before well, let me before, oh, on, before you jump into this, I just want to clarify um, Eileen means in her answer, she means to the participants when you're chatting um, to make sure that you select, there's a two section. Oh. Yeah. Oh, um, please, yep. uh, there's a drop down menu. Make sure to yep. select all panelists and all attendants so that everyone yes. can see your responses. Good. So, exactly. Yay. Otherwise, yep. we're the only one looking at what you're typing. So, yes, okay. yes. Thank you. Okay. All right. Hot seats over back to the two of you. So, oh. do you have a life? <laughs> well, I'm, I don't think I could really answer this um, because it says, what does a typical day or week look like? Yeah. There's never a typical day. Totally. Never. Exactly. Um, God. <laughs> Every day is an adventure. <laughs> it is. But, you know, I have to say that um, balancing your life has a lot to do with your attitude. That's where it really starts. You know, you have to kind of look at your priorities, uh, what's important to you. I can't say that <laughs> from the very get-go that I was very balanced. I mean, you know, um, I would get very angry when somebody would say, but you do, everything you do is about Tycho. Why don't you get a life? I got pissed off. <laughs> you know, I said, this is my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not going to get a life. Mm -hmm. This is my life. <laughs> so uh, along with that, it's like, it's not a nine to five, you know, schedule. And uh, for me, over time, um, my priorities shift, whether it's all Tycho related and the other life balance for me at this time in my life, I'm also caregiving. So uh, that's something that I never had to account for in my, my Tycho earlier life. You know, it, it was like just thinking about the future. But how do I look at myself and, um, in this case, my mother? Um, how do I handle this and still feel that this is my life balance, you know, and this is the attitude that I can have? If I was resentful, oh, my God. I think I would be one depressed person, <laughs> you know, but I've been able to uh, learn from what it, what it means to uh, take care of another. I mean, and this is like for other people who are, have had families, have children, you know, how do you make balance? How do you create that without getting angry or resentful uh, or saying that you're putting your life on the back burner? Uh, when the time comes, I can finally concentrate. No, take advantage for how you can integrate all that. I think like PJ, my life is 
there's there's not one typical day although very often now a, many days i am packing a bag and heading to the airport and getting on a plane and flying someplace to spend two to three days somewhere and then getting on a plane to fly somewhere else. I just got back from Portland's 25th um, and um, was supposed to be heading out to another workshop, but that got canceled. So a typical day now is scrambling, contacting groups to see if I can try and schedule more workshops. Um, lots of paperwork, lots of um, booking uh, airlines and renting trucks and <laughs> pre-production and post-production and thank you cards and, and administrative uh, decision making um, because I, you know, I still help Sasha, who's really running Sacramento mostly now with the senior senpai of my group, um, trying to make the decisions that need to be made. Uh, and answering texts, lots of texts, and surfing on Facebook and answering questions and um, answering emails from folks who have questions about Tycho. Um, and do I have personal time? Not very much of it, but that's probably my own lack of balance. Um, um, I, I tend to be um, really invested in probably too many projects. <laughs> any one given at any one point in time and so um trying to manage different uh our own self-produced concerts and helping people with their concerts and then planning workshops and um i get i, I try to go rafting twice a year uh personal time and i try to add in a day on either end of a workshop like to try and hang with people or see the sights of the, the city or town I'm visiting and then I'm on to the next place. So lots of moving around on a typical day. Lots yeah. of different hats to wear. Thanks both for like giving sort of these contexts and perspectives. I think oh, there's a lot of curiosity of the life of an artist um, and sometimes people don't understand the the spectrum and also the um, sort of density of, of the ways that we live our lives. Um, I'm going to switch gears into creative process. Um, Karen and I, alongside with the fellows, have been really talking about um, being creative and also in, in the context of, of women in Taiko community. And we wanted to make sure that we had um, a moment to illuminate to get some of your thoughts about composing. Um, I know both of you have um, composed and um, contributed some really iconic pieces. And um, if you could think of an approach or your approach, uh, what do you think of how you approach the idea of, of creating or composing um, motivations, influences? And I guess I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, kind of fold everything in. Uh, when you get stuck creatively, um, what do you do? Um, what are ways to get yourself out of that? So, you know, that's a big package. Um, but this idea of um, getting people in to spark the idea of um, creativity within the women in Taiko community has been one that's been sort of underlying and, and continual. So would love to get your thoughts and insights. I actually use a lot of different um, strategies when I'm composing. Sometimes it's as simple as I have a rhythm stuck in my head and I work to develop that. Um, other times I'll start with a theme or an idea that I want to convey and I'll try to build in the kata and the rhythms that support expressing that idea or that story. And sometimes it's a question of like now they have the right the the dice game that you have uh, rhythms on the dice and you roll them out and try and create things from there and when I get stuck um, I also very often turn to other compositions that I know and love or I'll go randomly onto YouTube and look at other Taiko pieces but also different music traditions and dance traditions from all over the world just to sort of spark that creativity in terms of trying to 
expand what I'm trying to say. I've gotten to the point where I think my, my compositions are fairly one dimensional, but then I also think I'm sort of composing to a certain level. And if I was composing for different people at a different level or different people with different skill sets, maybe my compositions might be a little bit more varied and diverse. Or I'm often uh, composing for people with one to five years experience. And so what I'm able to create is very different um, than if I was composing for Kodo, <laughs> <laughs> which I don't do, but yeah. They're calling. Yeah. <laughs> um, for myself, um, I, I think that I I tend to create modular pieces. Modular meaning from the, uh, something very simple that you can add something else that for for another group uh, of experienced people, and then um, uh, for outdoors, um, can you have an outdoor thing and then also an indoor thing, but the same piece. I kind of like to think modularly. Uh, because then um, the theme of who I am artistically and creatively, it's all there. It's embedded, you know, not so much just to be uh, thinking, uh, oh, has this ever been done? Oh, I want to do something innovative all the time. You know, uh, that's not my style. I think everything that starts from my inspiration starts with a pulse <laughs> inside my body that's all i hear is a pulse and if my body is moving and then oh there's another rhythm that kind of like folds into that and then oh gosh i think this is almost like a dance or movement you know a movement and dance type of um uh elements are very uh i would say necessary <laughs> for me to incorporate um and I think that's about it. But as far as getting stuck creatively, it's also um, not necessarily looking for other taiko groups or other music, but yeah, just kind of like finding places where energy <laughs> gets ignited, whether it is just a pulse <laughs> or just the people's expressions of coming together in a circle, you know. Um, that, that's where I get inspired. It's like seeing people kind of like, that, that's where I want to go. That's where I want to take my compositions. I want to ignite that same uh, uh, in, inclusion uh, and feeling that, oh, my body's moving. Yeah, I can do that. You know, uh, that's how I like to create my pieces. And that's how I like to go towards if I'm stuck. <laughs> Thank you. Tiffany, I noticed that we had a little furry friend that came behind. <laughs> um, we have another panelist joining another us. Another panelist joining us. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, do you, in, in your lives though, um, well, I kind of already know the answer, but, but can you introduce your little furry friend that, that just. Um, oh yeah, that's Galaxy there? or Galligator of the clan Fuzzy Butt. <laughs> <laughs> TJ, who have your furry friends been? I we don't have any more furry friends. But you they've have. all yeah. Oh, you mean like what I go to sleep with, my stuffed animal? <laughs> 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 Too much information. Okay. <laughs> but I was just gonna try to give some insight that furry friends are a, a good component of, of um, inspiration. Companion. Yes, inspiration. Oh, inspiration. Inspiration and, you know, companion. And life balance, life balance. Life balance, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually only able to have furry friends because uh, my partner has furry friends um, because I'm never home long enough to oh. take care of pets. And, and 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 some of you may have seen on Facebook. I I'm to doing this little photo project with the pets of of people who I am home staying with, and I try to match their. Uh, <laughs> this is me trying to be an artist. Um, I try to match their expression, 
Um, oh, is that what you've been doing? That's, that's, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's the whole thing. Um, what do you mean? You match you match the person's expression. No, I match the the, the the animal expression. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> the yeah. whole photo project. It, it's like, this whole thing. Yeah, dozens of photos of her and the animal, and she is imitating them. Okay, that's awesome. Okay. <laughs> Work decisions. Shall we? So shall we talk about that? Sure. Oh, well, let me just ask. Can we ask the crowd oh. if they have any specific questions about composition? Oh yeah, that's that's important. Yeah. Hear from you. I know, composition. I I know that there's been a lot of curiosities. I know we've had some really deep conversation um, in our fellowship program. So what's if there was anything more specific that you were interested in about composition? Um, what 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 questions are you wondering about? And okay, so there's come some questions, but the other thing I want us to think about is like when you get stuck, what do you do? Because that might oh, be that's cool. cool yeah, I but love Desmond that. Desmond from Wales is asking, who do you compose for? That's mm -hmm. like, do you think about who? Do you think about the who as you're composing? Uh, well, certainly, um, when I'm composing, I, I'm generally composing for a group or for like for example, Joy Bubble, um, I was trying to compose a piece that people from every level, from people who were just starting to that day to people who had been playing 20 or more years. And I had to come up with a piece that everybody could play in, in that group, in that workshop. And so um, certainly there's that aspect of it. Um, and I think part of that question is, do you compose for yourself? to create what you want to say, or do you compose so that people will enjoy it? Mm -hmm. And that's one of the, th one of the challenges. Um, there are pieces like, for example, that I didn't understand when I was first starting out, I didn't have a great appreciation for monochrome uh, as a, as a young Tycho player, because it was very technical and very textured and moody. And I was more into the power, happy, jumpy, um, bright, uh, exuberant Tycho pieces and it took a lot of time for me to have a sense or an appreciation of what that piece, the beauty of that piece. And so I think in terms of who you're composing for, sometimes it's a mix of for your audience, for your group or for yourself. Um, and I do have one bit of advice uh, in terms of composition for those of you that are writing pieces. Very often I have and I see people trying to add more and more and more and more. So we've got this rhythm, we're gonna add this, we're gonna add this movement, we're gonna add this. And people try and push their own limits within the piece and, and, and there ends up being not a whole lot of space in the piece. And so it's a really good thing to, um, what I compose for now is for space. To, I've tried and edit to, to, to find a clean, uh, a bit of space within the piece and clear themes that I can develop and play with as opposed to the next more challenging, next more fun thing to play that we can also add into it bit by bit because it, it, that happens a lot, so. And there's a question from Allison about like, what are, when you make a composition for others, what are they about? Like I do, Tiffany, are you mostly thinking about their skill level or like, do you have a, like a theme or when you're making a composition for someone in a group? I think, well, it, it's, it, it runs the gamut because sometimes people are asking for things that are specifically about uh, local, like the salmon or the, the forest or some, something that is particular to that region or something that is particular to that group. And sometimes I am thinking about, very often I'm composing to the skill sets of the group and, and for the groups that I work with on a continuous basis, I'm trying to create something that is gonna give them just a little bit of a push technically so that, that they're able to play a song and that it's going to advance them towards where they wanna go as musicians and artists. Well, in that way, I've also, when I talk about modular, yeah, how do you, uh, use the ingredient of more challenges, but then still have the very basic for anybody almost. We have a couple more questions, but I know we have other things, topics to cover. Um, but yeah, but I think some, well, let's see if we could do a quick fire answer. Um, like, 
Jesse was asking uh, what motive, basically what's your motivation for, comp what makes you compose? Um, uh, why do you do it? Why do you compose? Groups gotta have songs to play. Groups wanna play. <laughs> um, practical. It practically the basic reason, um, but really um, art, speaking as an artist, um, I compose because the voices of the drums are, they sing to me. They, they, it's a way to, to put ideas and concepts and feelings out into the world and um, connect with people. So the, the big motivation is to find ways to express what it means to be a human, what, it's, what it means to be um, not just a taiko player, but an artist. Um, who's living in the world. So sometimes it's about bringing people joy when political situations in the world are complicated or bringing people a sense of empowerment or identity through music um, that I know I can have an impact on my community. I know I can have an impact on my group. I know I can have an impact in the world by creating pieces that move people, that inspire and engage them. I have to also say that for me, maybe I I don't I don't have a, a lot of um, just standalone compo compositions. What I do have is like collaborative compositions, mm -hmm. in which this is my style. I I want the group or individual to kind of find their voice creatively, and like I'll be there like. How, how to integrate ideas and it, it becomes kind of a, a, a team effort but at the same time it's like not having groups have to rely on other people's compositions I mean that's just me that's great because Liz was asking about the challenges to collaborate yeah. composing exactly I think one of the other challenges is that as you're composing things and as there, there are rhythms or sections that work really, really well and they sound really great, but then as you're finalizing or pulling the piece together, you have to let go of some of them because they don't end up working or sometimes you have this really incredible rhythm that you've thought up, but it's actually physically impossible to play. Um, to be able to recognize that and to be able to work with somebody in, in a respectful way or in, uh, yeah, in a respectful way, be able to work with each other and say, yeah, this, this part doesn't work for this one. Let's save it for another piece. And that's the great thing about it is you can always spin that, that rhythm off and create something new, but to be able to recognize um, when something needs to be taken out, that's probably one of the hardest things to do um, in terms of working together collaboratively. I agree with that too. Um, in in so doing there, that, we have to have a, a set of ground rules in a way that you have to um, be flexible. Everybody who comes to the table with ideas is that not to be so insistent upon things have to be in there or my way is the only way. So it's a great time uh, to see uh, our own mannerisms <laughs> and our habits and the way we handle situations. But I think that's part of the creative process as well, to be integrated in composing. This uh, next question that came from the chat, um, and it's a, it's a big one. I know that this has been uh, something that I've heard uh, throughout my Tycho life and also my creative life too, is how do you suggest approaching the issue of what Tycho is? when you have an idea that is not necessarily embedded in Japanese cultural tradition or seems like it might break those bounds. So, you know, like what, how are you um, making some of those decisions? You know, we talked about contemporary innovation and all those sorts of things. How, where, where do you see those um, sort of like lines and decision-making in your composition? Um, it's been a huge question for me um personally and the the decision i came to was that taiko is defined by the the viewer what what is or what is not taiko is a matter of personal preference and um i know what i like and i know what i appreciate about it and i know what i think is or is not taiko for me but 
I can't necessarily define that for anybody else but me and the groups that I work with or the, the artists that I, I work with. And in terms of pushing the limits of what we're doing, I mean, it's a constantly evolving art form. So it's not, it's up for history to, to define what it is or what it becomes. I certainly, um, I've been in a situation where I've played a taiko drum with a symphony orchestra and what I was doing to me was not taiko at all. Um, mm. But I've had uh, like Mr. Asano um, say, well, as long as there's a taiko drum involved, it's taiko. So, uh, <laughs> which is it, the sound, the character, the movement, the feeling, all these things that define taiko to me and what I appreciate and love about it uh, is my opinion. And I think everybody's going to have a different one over time. And in, in doing the competitions in, in Japan, they always look for things that are innovative. They're always looking for the art to grow and expand. And yet some of the judges' comments are, that's not Japanese enough, or that's too Japanese. I've, I've, in, in doing Odaiko competitions, I've had both of those comments. But what I was doing was too Japanese, and then the next time it wasn't Japanese enough. So again, that was the judge's opinion on what Taiko should be. And that's the thing about those contests is that it's, they're sort of arbitrary in a way because everybody has a different opinion. It's pretty um, slippery slope for me. Um, that um, not, not for me in general, uh, I, I know what my values are. I know what I want to pull from. I know what, what it is to be respectful of others and also other, uh, like, I, I can't win people over because that's the way they think. It's, it's perception, right? Um, but I, I do try and by leading by example, I don't know. And then how do I also uh, actually comment, especially cultural appropriation? Um, you know, it, it, it's that Taiko is becoming so familiar that people will just want to use the sound because it is cool. I mean, it's wonderful sound and yet not understand where it comes from. Um, that is one thing that I really feel is necessary. Um, not to say that you have to do this because it's Japanese or it, you know that's the respectful way, but it's like, how do we cultivate uh, this community values of respect? And what, what are you being inspired by? Or what are you stealing from? You know, uh, there's different ways to look at that. So I'm I think, very careful about that. The issue of cultural appropriation is an interesting one for me too, because it's, it, to a certain extent, it's my understanding, some of the traditional Matsuri Bayashi groups um, are still not happy with how their traditional pieces were adapted to the stage by Onde Koza and Kodo. And to a certain extent, almost all we're doing with Taiko taken out of its context as accompaniment to dance and theater and, and vocals is, is, it is a cultural appropriation. Even for those of us who are doing the standard traditional pieces or what we, we come to, have come to understand is like classic or traditional pieces, they were appropriated from traditional festival groups in many cases. And so it's, it's, it's a challenge to, to have as much respect for the tradition and the culture that it's based in and yet be able to speak and, and, and use the instruments to convey who we are as artists, as contemporary artists super complex but one of the things that I was hearing resonate with both of both of these sort of like an understand there's like a research though there's also some um his, like understanding of history um so it's not just a drum right or just there it is um and so uh there is there's a place of um and you know uh, how deep you can go, how long you could go, but just an understanding of that beyond just uh, just one instrument, um, a sound maker. Um, so there's a couple more questions. Karen, how are you feeling? Do you think we have 
Do you want to slip them in or, or should we yeah. move on? Okay. I mean, yeah. We'll just. Well, the next one is actually really interest, interesting for Margaret. Um, and uh, Margaret said, asks, how do you feel about people sharing your compositions without your participation or permission? I, I don't know if <laughs> I don't know if anyone should feel good about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or what do you do about it? I mean, I mean oh, yeah, yeah. It, like, it, how have you responded? Like, imitation to that? Is, is the greatest form of flattery, and it, it's interesting because it, the same thing. And again, speaking to the the last thing of, of appropriation, is that like. Miyake has been adapted and the traditional form of Miyake is um, the, the festival way and then there's the way that <laughs> adapted for the stage with the solos and all the, the fancy movements and everything and when the volcano started to go and everybody was being evacuated from the island and they were worried that that style was going to sort of fade out and disappear because they weren't going to be there anymore you know, here they're the rest of the world has a bit of that culture as it's developed and moved forward. And I've had pieces that, of mine that have been like I surfing through YouTube and here's a group that I've never seen before playing a piece that I've composed and it's like, wow, that's, that's really cool and also really terrible because you, you, maybe you don't know why, what, what, what's important to me about that piece or, um, you know, um, it, it's not something I'm ever happy about, um, except when I'm dead and gone, I, I do want my music to live on and the more people that are playing it, <laughs> the better chance that that's going to happen, so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, how many cover bands are there in the world? And, and sure. like, if everybody's covering Kokorozashi, yay! And yay. You know, I also, it's hard because I guess the other issue is, and we're not the music industry, but the whole being able to, to make a living as an artist and have compositions and to have that model of, of, of um, that is a, a resource of mine that if you're taking and performing and then everybody's performing my song, what do I have that's different to, to market, to, to get out into the world and, and make a living off of? That's the other question that, that that goes into that and mm -hmm. I you know I, I want my songs to be played well and I want my songs to endure and, and it's, it's complicated I guess answer that I'm giving but mm -hmm. it's great and it's horrible mm. <laughs> um, I, I think I tend to create pieces that I want to have um, what um, uh, open source <laughs> to be open source so uh, I kind of set myself up like that you know and mm -hmm. and then sometimes even though it's open source I would like to still um, be credited for this composition oftentimes not uh, I, I it's almost like giving birth to something and you want to know that it's going to that this is going to a good family, you know, and you want to know, <laughs> you want to know like how it grows up and what, what you're doing, you know, I mean, I, I, that, that's more of this personal touchy feely thing that I personally <laughs> like in building a Taiko community. I mean, that's what kind of also builds Taiko community too. It's like, Oh, you know, this is what my group has done with your, my, you know, your composition PJ, you know, and there's something very, um, connecting about that you know it doesn't feel like oh you learned that piece but it just seems like full circle you know we're creating a, a larger circle um but i do have uh qualms with people who will take something and rename it oh, yeah. and we've seen that like with both mine and roy's compositions that were more group related um yeah that has no place. <laughs> I think you basic answer of like nobody should feel good about this. <laughs> yeah. 
I think we should move on to the um, last couple of sections. Um, and um, maybe also uh, just to warm people up to is we did want to have like an open question period as well. So if you wanted to start thinking about that, you're welcome to um, start putting that into the chat. Um, but I do wonder, uh, Karen, if we if we want to talk about work or if we want to talk about the community, since we, we're also talking about community at large right now. Uh, you mean pick one or the other? Yeah, why don't we start with one and then see if we have time for the other. Okay, so let's talk about the Tyco community then. Um, yeah. And I want to acknowledge Allison did ask a question about uh, gender. So yeah. this is kind of related. Why do you yeah. think community groups tend to be predominantly women players, but professional players, performers, teachers are predominantly men? Or this is a question that we've been kind of pondering throughout the women in Tycho wave. Um, yeah. But what's your sense of? I think a part of it does speak to the tradition um, and gender bias that's been um, certainly adapted from Japan and, and the way it has been taught and the way that certainly professionals who are peers bring each other along. I think it's it's not necessarily easier for guys to become professionals. I think that there is um, not more incentive. It, it's just more accessible um, in certain ways. Uh, I think it, it also comes down, it, it, it's, it's not unique to Tycho. This is, a, this is an issue that, that, that people in the dance community face, that people in Western musical traditions face. Um, in cooking, <laughs> chefs, um, <laughs> there are more male chefs than there are um, women. There are more male doctors. It, it, this, is, this is endemic to, to life um, in our modern society. Um, but certainly, uh, speaking, um, as a professional, it seems that it, it's just men tend to have more financial community resources in a way that I as a woman have not um, to a certain respect. And I think that filters down into as, as other women are considering moving into becoming professional players. Um, you have to think about what jobs you're going to get and how you're going to get by and you know there's certain certainly if there's any desire to be a parent um, it is physically much more difficult for a woman to get through the whole process of having a baby and and being a parent um, that's going to take a little bit more time away from their ability to um, train and and to tour and to do the actual physical work of getting out to classes. Um, not that pregnancy is a big, huge hurdle. Lots of parents, of incredible uh, women, uh, taiko players who've become parents and gone through that. Um, but I just think overall, um, it's a lot easier. And to a certain extent, it's cultural, where guys are more likely to put themselves out in a way that women don't. And because um, and looking at how workshop selections are made uh, for different events. Um, it's harder because people don't know who the women artists are because they're not necessarily putting them out, marketing themselves in the same way, um, is my sense of it. Um, just sort of the last, as the Women in Tycho movement has progressed and we've tried to get more women workshop facilitators and some of the pushback has been, well, who is this and what, you know, what does she do and, and can she actually teach and does she actually play and why, um, if, you know, it's a question of this guy or this woman, we should go with the guy that we know is a good facilitator um, instead of bringing in this woman who, you know, may be from the same group, but, um, we don't know her skill level or we don't know if she'll be as accessible or as it, you know, because they haven't been teaching, then they don't get hired. Um, kind of that's at least that's what my sense of things looking at it more specifically in the past couple of years. 
Yeah. This was something that we talked a lot about at the first uh, Women in Tycho um, STI two years ago, right? When we, Tiffany and I facilitated, we were all there. Um, and, you know, one of the big things was uh, women feeling like they weren't qualified, right? That they, um, they didn't have the chops um, because they don't like meet all these different qualifications. And it was funny because people were saying that like, men who had one or two years experience felt fine sort of throwing their name in the hat. Um, but women who had, you know, 15 years or 20 years experience didn't feel like they had, you know, the qualifications. And I think, you know, as we've been asking this question of the community for the last um, couple of years, we've really pushed each other um, to like throw your name in anyway, you know? Um, and I think we can't, um, we can't not talk about also like gender bias and, and, and sexism and the conditioning um, that we've experienced that would, um, you know, that, that, that is backed up by institutions and society that say, you know, we're not quite qualified enough, you know? Um, so that, that really gets in the way of us putting ourselves forward. Um, and also, you know, one thing that we discovered you know, is that there's, we have to build networks, you know, and I think that's why these webinars, that's why, um, you know, these retreats, that's why the fellowship program, so that we can really continually, you know, sort of battle the, that message and that conditioning in our mind. It's like, yes, you can do it. <laughs> Let me remind you that you can do this. Um, and I think that that's something we have to actively battle um, and develop. Um, the, we have to battle those messages and we have to develop the systems to contradict those messages. PJ, as you've gone, seen through um, the years of your, uh, of Tycho in your life, um, what are your thoughts as, as we were bringing this conversation forward and looking at some of the trends? Well, I, you said everything that I also agree to that, um, you know, there, there have not been too many role models, you know, that are out there professionally. It's mostly men, you know, and it also has uh, a particular character of how those men play. So it's perpetuating kind of a stereotype of what Tycho should be. And um, what I'm seeing, you know, is th different layers are happening. And it's for both men and women that now it, that Tycho culture is starting to expand to include other instruments, you know, where I feel that there's a lot more women that are standing up to sing uh, or dance or um, uh, shamisen, you know, uh, other instruments that will be part of the ensemble. You know, I, I think these are another way to look at how to develop that leadership and also have roles for women, um, hopefully more so in the, in the future. Yeah, I just want to add to this. I think it's really important. I think something that we've been really trying to think about is like, you know, often we say you can't be what you can't see, you know, or what you don't see. You can't be what you don't see. Is that what it is? Yes. Is that how that quote goes? It's like, if you see Tycho only done this particular way, hard, fast, strong, this way, on stage, like that's supposed to be what Tycho is. So that makes it difficult if you do Tycho in a different way, um, in a different capacity, with different values, like, is that Tycho? And I think that's what I'm also seeing in the community. Um, you see a lot, and I, you know, that's sort of where I've been really pushing, you know, like the Tycho for all, uh, Tycho and community work, um, uh, you know, Tycho and social change work. Like there's different kinds of ways of doing Tycho. And um, I guess there's a question artistically, you know, what is Tycho? You know, we've been talking about that, but like, I feel like, there's many valid ways to be a Tycho artist. Um, and I think part of the challenge is actually giving that work visibility so that people can say, oh, I don't need to do it like that. You know, I can do it like this. Um, and 
I think that um, it's really exciting when I think about the Tyco ecosystem really actually being presented in a way that's not just this sort of box of how we play Tyco and how we how we are artists as Tyco, how we are Tyco artists. Um, I do want to ask one specific question that came in um, on email um, that has to do with this. This is from Emily Harada. Um, what challenges did you face studying in Japan being a woman and how did you overcome it? That's your question. <laughs> That's question. Oh, um, you know, as a woman there, to a certain extent, because I was Japanese American and because I was female and because I do play uh, more uh, power styles of Taiko competently, um, I was kind of an oddity in Japan and that gave me a foot in the door. I mean, uh, and this is me not saying that, yeah, I was a pretty good Taiko player and so I had a place on that stage um, because I also lack that confidence sometimes. Um, but there always, the, the fact that I, I, that I am a woman has always benefited me in weird ways and always held me back in others because to a certain extent, in Japan, it, it is still very much a male dominated uh, art form in many respects, except that there are also a number of incredible women artists who have made a name for themselves and have built careers for themselves. Um, it was always sort of understood that as a woman that I would be serving the tea um, and that I would be uh, cleaning up uh, when everybody else was doing other things in some groups and that was a challenge um, because that was the expectation the cultural expectation is I would take care of the laundry and I would take care of the tea and I would take care of all these things because I'm the woman um, in some groups not all groups um, in other respects um, it allowed me to really I, I was able to use being a woman as a strength um, and being an American as a strength in as much as it, when I first started and to a certain extent, it's not true anymore. You, once you started with a group, you were with that group and you couldn't really go and train with other groups or join and study with other groups. And I'd be able to go, it's like, oh, well, I'm a woman and I really don't, you know, to, to play that I don't really know anything and I really love Taiko. So this is what this guy showed me. What do you guys do? Um, and that actually also um, was an advantage uh, that I, that I, the, <laughs> that my gender sort of allowed me to play to um, in terms of, yeah, I guess that's pretty much all I have to say about that. I, I, um, I think one of the things is seeing peers around me again, and this is why it's been such a uh, last 10, 15 years, a big thing for me is that um, I, I don't see women still in many respects um, as respected, as successful, as promoted, as accessible, um, as uh, uh, celebrated as some of their male counterparts. And um, so being a woman in Japan has just always kept me right at that place of really wanting to see something shift. I'd like to um, just also add, because I did spend um, some time in my, of my life in Japan studying, and um, I didn't necessarily study Taiko, um, but I did study uh, specifically and deeply steeped steep myself in, in studying folk traditions and, and Japanese folk dance at Watabiva in Northern Japan. And um, I, it wasn't about gender, um, but it was about identity as a Japanese American um, that T Tiffany, you also illuminated upon. And I know PJ, you've also, you know, you've often 
um, taken odysseys to Japan too. Um, but my time going to Japan was definitely this continual search to find home, you know, and, and trying to find homeland as we've heard some um, political rhetoric about just to go back home. And so I was always like, where is that? Um, and I thought Japan was, was the place. And in, in, in lots of ways it is. Um, I'm Japanese American, fourth generation. Um, but going to Japan confused me even more than I had ever uh, even imagined for myself. It's just like a whole other world of like identity came about um, complexity, doubt, um, being good enough, you know, because uh, as much as like I was invited to perform and uh, do many stages at Wadabiza and um, afterwards we would do uh, thank yous with the audience and so forth. And if I didn't open my mouth, everyone would be like, you're great. Um, but the minute I said something because of, you know, my pronunciation and my lack of language, um, then there were multiple responses that happened. Um, some that are just like, good for you, you found your, you're coming back or to you're never gonna be good enough. So the spectrum of like really having to face all of this as I am still really confused about myself, I, I think that was really, really hard. Um, and, and, but it also made me strong. So it was like one of the hardest experiences I went through in my life. And then I was like, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to America. Um, and I know what I'm going to do when I, when, I, when I return because there was a place that I needed to go, uh, go, go there and, and really live there. And, and then, of course, as, as many of you may know, I um, also met my husband there. Um, so my life kind of expanded in many many, many different ways of what Japan is in my personal life too. Um, but then it uh, just became an opportunity for me to keep finding conversation and really ask myself hard questions about what I really felt um, it was to be Japanese American. Um, and, and that's one of the things that, that I know that uh, Japan, um, challenged me and and elevated for my life and i know pj you have gone oftentimes you've worked in japan you've collaborated um and i i wonder when you like went to japan what what was your journey what, what were some things that you discovered as as that um hmm. I have to say that the first time I went to Japan was like right after I graduated from Berkeley. And it's like, I'm going to go meet my people <laughs> because I'm, mar I'm, I'm part of my, you know, I'm marginalized here in, in America. I'm going to go with my people. And then I go there and they're not my people. <laughs> and I, I, or they don't regard me as them either. So yeah, it confused me. It really confused me. And that, it was like that first trip and going back, coming back to America. And right after that, it's like seeing Tycho uh, or starting San Jose Tycho. It's like, yeah, this is not made in Japan Tycho. You know, this is like, you know, wine barrel Tycho and it comes out of this community. And um, no, a lot of people don't speak Japanese. Okay, that other guy who feels like he he's more Japanese than me because he can speak Japanese and he's not Asian, you know, is like touting that over me. I'm going, whose problem is that? That's my problem. I put I I I paint myself in the corner for feeling less than. Um, but finding that okay, I'm finding my voice through this instrument. That this instrument is allowing me to, uh, yeah uncover something that's already there and and it's something that is strong it is my superpower <laughs> it is all of our superpowers right and so if it weren't for taiko i don't think i would have found that place of home because i would always be looking 
oh, I can't find it there. I can't find it there. It's like, how do we create here? How do we create it here? And um, I think that's what emboldened me, you know, to say, uh, this art form is standalone. It doesn't need to be saying, I learned this from this generation and this generation, and I was given the opportunity to play the song. No, <laughs> this art form allowed me to find who I am and how I connect. And um, yeah, all those other trips to Japan, you know, it's always thinking about, oh, how are they regarding me? But it's more like out of observation. You know, what is it about how they're regarding me that's limiting them about me? You know, uh, <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> how can we expand how their perception is um, limited? You know, how can you accept me and my art form to stand on its own and to um, accept and, and to, yeah, respect? <laughs> I'd like to think that to a certain extent because um and, and adding one last thing as a woman in Japan um and just as a woman performing taiko in the world the way I do it and the way I have done it at the time I did it that I did allow people who thought women couldn't do it for whatever reason uh, an opportunity to see that certainly women could um and uh, I, the, the whole gender bias thing, the, the, especially this traditional gender bias thing, um, hasn't, as much as it's been a, a, a roadblock, has also been the thing that inspires me the most to, to, to stand up and say, no, you cannot tell me that I cannot do this because I am a woman. Um, that, that probably one of the driving factors uh, from very early on. I, I like to add on that is um, that you can't have people tell you who you are yeah. or to define you. I, I, I want to share something that I was just um, interviewed for this uh, drum magazine. Um, Please be looking for this issue. <laughs> it's called 21st Century Drummer. And um, actually, one of the questions asked, um, how do you deal with sexism in the industry? And I have to say that you can't stand alone and that um, you to stand with your peers and supporters um, so that um, the other thing that I alluded to, I said, in the Tycho community, we have this website, <laughs> Tycho and Women. You know, oh. to, <laughs> I, 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 I brought a recognition to that, that we're, we're dealing with how we look at gender, you know, and uh, how it plays in the Tycho community. So I just wanted to say that, yes, this is what it's all about. It's building these stepping stones that we have all created through Women in Taiko. It's making it visible, having given, by giving more opportunity to have different examples and models, uh, more communication, interaction. You know, I think that's expanding the possibilities. And we love I Lisa. Lisa Shioda put in the link to the 21st Century Drummer website yes. fabulous yep. thank you lisa yay thank you Thanks, lisa. lisa that that was such a wonderful uh place uh to land right now and as we have 15 more minutes we did want to acknowledge the opportunity for anyone to ask any questions i know that some questions have been asked i'm scrolling right now um and we're as we as we get to this place, um, I, I feel like I'm scrolling and trying. Well, let's talk about this one: is barriers. Um, I know that you both spoke of like, what, is there any other ways that of thinking about breaking barriers? Um, is one of the questions here. I like ways, yeah. um, Karen Falkenstrom 
put out, I, I can't remember, was in a, just a conversation or in a forum. She's like, hire women. Hire as many yeah. women as you can. Create events. Create And mm -hmm. just like, her beat is coming. Um, yes. Thank you. <laughs> We're going to see each other. <laughs> We're Yay. All, together. all of us are going to be there. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> Um, that that was a, a was an event created. I mean, my brainchild, but Jen Weir took it and ran with it and got an incredible amount of funding to hire lots of women to come together and create and express and to hopefully carry on sort of this momentum of women artists getting visibility and women artists having a chance to create and support each other. So. I hope you all can make it. February 29th, Minneapolis. Let's go. Ordway. Mm -hmm. It's going to be an historic, amazing, incredible fun event. Yes. So please, please come. Because there'll be workshops and all the things. Mm -hmm. And a performance. And a performance. And a performance. Many artists that you see. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the next time. Um, we're going to see each other in person. That yeah. might be, yeah. It That's might. exciting. And, oh, maybe not. Maybe not. Oh. I'll see you sooner. I, um, I don't think, can I just add something? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I'm really responding to, to the question, but I, I realize I, I didn't uh, explain like where I am <laughs> other than what you okay. know <laughs> that um, many of you may know that I've, you know, have left San Jose Taiko, and what I've started is Taiko Peace. And this is like mm -hmm. over a decade. And for me, I knew what peace meant, you know, the inner and outer peace. <laughs> <laughs> and also, you know, over the landscape of my experiences, I see that the power of Taiko in, it, in its purest form is about unity. And so I, I feel that it's what I know, you know, to see uh, conflict and dissension in, in our community. Diversity is good if we can have dialogue, you know, if we can have communication. Uh, and this is what um, my Taiko piece originally was trying to foster, either even just in what I created or how I teach my workshops. But I have to share with you just only a couple months ago, it, uh, there was this download saying, you know, you need an acronym for peace <laughs> because everybody's understanding of what peace is is different. And so um, this is what it is. Tycho Peace is partnerships in empathy and creative empowerment. So it, it is exactly what we're doing here uh, with the women and Tycho. It's like we can't stand alone. We need dialogue. We need communication we need interaction we need support we need ad to advocate um these are the partnerships how do we make partnerships that are healthy mm -hmm. great we are gonna ask uh one more um question and uh karen well I, well, actually, I found it. I'll ask it since I'm here. What has been the most rewarding professional or artistic mistake you've made? Jen Weir's question. Jen Weir, who is, again, her beat. Yeah. Yes. Organizer. <laughs> the most what, Missionary. again? Most, oh, no. A lo I the most it. rewarding oh, professional or artistic mistake? <laughs> Becoming a taiko drummer. <laughs> <laughs> what's been the most rewarding or artistic mistake like mistake. you know i i was on a panel with women that were talking about ceo ceos in silicon valley that were saying they don't even like take each other seriously unless they their company is burnt down but like out of out of mistakes or challenges come learning and growth often is there one that you can point to Oh, you're thinking. <laughs> Your question stumps our panelists. <laughs> oh, they're thinking. Okay. 
I think that there's a cultural like a thing of with the word mistake, you know, like it, it's a well, hard I, word to face. Yes, go, PJ. Yeah. No, I, I'm just gonna define mistake. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's let's we could reword it. It, it. Well, the mistake is like you know, it's how you regard things, right? A mistake or a, a problem or whatever that boxes you in. You know, I think um, um, it. I had to work on not boxing myself in, mm -hmm. and that uh, whenever I looked at challenges, I always thought of it as, "Oh gosh, another problem! <laughs> mm -hmm. I have to extinguish that." <laughs> but then it's good for character building <laughs> it, it, it has you looking at things a lot more clearly sometimes not if you're not in that space but it's like i i i have to use gratitude okay. uh, so that's my practice of gratitude is probably not the mistake but a rewarding inclusion in in my way i look at what i do uh with my taiko and with life so um, to place that these hardships or challenges, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you for allowing me to see other ways for me to transform myself, to, um, to learn from this that makes me stronger. Because um, I know what it feels like just to be angry all the time <laughs> and carry a problem along and keep it there, you know, on the shelf and pull it down, like whenever you're confronted with it. Um, yeah, I, I have to say, because of Tycho, the life of Tycho, my path has allowed me to um, practice more <laughs> about how to be more at peace with myself. <laughs> I have to say, I feel like as Tycho, artists as performers like we are forced to live in the moment and handle things right um something goes out of awry something a drum falls something some piece goes haywire and you have to adapt in the moment i think it really builds a character <laughs> and we develop a resilience um that i think we can carry into our lives and i think pj you you know you really sort of talked about perspective really you know taking a, a moment that may feel like a total challenge or a problem or a mistake and like really, you know, it's a shift of how we think about mistake, right? Like, that's, I love that answer. Um, I know we're almost done. We only yeah. have not that much time, but there was a specific question Allison was asking about, she's writing her master's thesis on women in Tycho, hooray. Um, send it to the website. We can maybe put it up or something like that. Share that information. Other than what you have already talked about, are there other resources or individuals that are helpful to those more interest, uh, those more interesting in the women in Tycho movement? Any more resources and individuals? We're gonna have more webinars. That's, I was about to say this. I was, yeah, exactly. Um, so this is a series of webinars and um, conversations to get different perspectives. I feel like uh, we're really trying to provide um, conversations and hopefully these conversations can be um, also a, a source of knowledge, a source of like um, resource uh, for anyone. And so uh, next, um, next webinar is gonna be in two weeks on Tuesday. Um, we're gonna be, it's called Emergence. And um, uh, please also check the times because it's slightly different uh, based on different availabilities of, of the folks that could um, be panelists. So uh, know that it's not the exact time every single, every single time. Um, but the folks that are gonna be in that conversation uh, with us is Tomomi Hongo, Man Man Mui, and uh, Vicky Zhang, um, all bringing in their perspectives of um, uh, playing taiko and, and and um, developing themselves. And then on uh, Tuesday, December 17th, um, 
we have a webinar that's going to uh, feature our four fellows who are closing off their seven month fellowship. Sort of sad that the journey um, is not at an end, but it is um, at a milestone. So um, come join us for that milestone on Tuesday, uh, December 17th. Um, and we're gonna be talking about what, what this fellowship um, sort of progressed through and some of the experiences and some of the reflections. And if you wanna know more about the reflect or know more about this fellowship, it's a great opportunity to, to hear about the program as well as leadership development. Um, I do wonder if there's any last sort of uh, last thoughts from PJ, Tiffany, Karen, um, and then also from from all of you all. Thanks so much for joining joining us for for these two hours together. Thank you, Karen and Michelle, for having this idea and making it a reality. The, the seeds have been planted. We don't know what color the flowers are going to be. <laughs> you know, this is the, this is the first time we've done this, so we would love, oh my gosh, Izumi's asking where to make a donation. Thank you. Go well, to the site. Hooray. This does cost money to host. This, um, thank you so much. Uh, we hope to be having more things like this. PJ, did I cut you off? Did you want to say more? No, it's okay. Okay. Um, the these, are, these are the flowers. Yeah, the flowers. Um, <laughs> these are being recorded. They are going to be on, uh, we'll post them up on the website. Um, we want them accessible. We want them viewed. We want them shared. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if you have any feedback or comments, anything at all, we'd love to hear them because we want to improve. Um, and we've tried our best to make this interactive and engaging and Hey, this is a great start. Yeah. Thank you, PJ, Tiffany, Michelle. Thank you. Yes, thank Everybody. you, thank you. All right, well, it's um, time, I think, and uh, lots of gratitude for our every, this was more than we had ever anticipated. Thank you for everyone who joined us today. That was really amazing. I'm and thank you for, go ahead. Michelle. Oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, and I'm seeing like our chat going like uh, like crazy. Thank you so much uh, for all of your wonderful comments here. And so the website is womenintyco.org, and there is a link there to make a donation. Womenintyco.org. Cool. Great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Be well, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Go out and do awesome. <laughs> <laughs>